Well, good morning. I am so excited to be with you all this morning and see some of you in person. For those of you who are joining online and maybe tuning in with us for the very first time, obviously I am not Pastor Carrie. So please make sure you tune in next week so you can hear from him. He is enjoying vacation time with his family. I am Amy Castello, the family pastor here at Meadowbrook, and excited to spend time with you talking about Galatians 2 this morning. Um, let's pray real quick. Gracious God, I just ask this morning that you give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Well, many of you know that Pastor Kerry and I are considered on church staff to be tied for the title of the most directionally challenged. It baffles my husband, Charlie, that I can go somewhere and then I cannot turn around and get home. I mean, it's as simple as reversing directions, right? Well, wrong if you are directionally challenged. For those of us who are directionally challenged, we always take the long way. It is pretty irritating to me that in the 30 years that I've known Charlie, he has never been wrong about directions. Now that does not mean I still do not argue with him about the fastest route to take, and lo and behold, I am always wrong. Well, last week, Pastor Kerry started a series on the book of Galatians, and he'll be spending um, a week talking about an entire chapter. And this morning, he emphasized, I mean, last week, he emphasized in chapter one that we are free in Christ. Paul challenges us in Galatians 1, verse 10. Am I now trying to win approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And this verse leads to why, to why Peter gets himself in trouble in chapter two. I do feel like Peter, or Cephas, as his name is in Aramaic, I feel like he's just like me when I argue with Charlie about directions. You see, Peter's usually not right when he argues philosophies and theologies, yet in our chapter, he's still trying to do that with Paul. What's happening in the first 10 verses of chapter two is that Paul is being tasked by God to preach the good news of Jesus to the non-Jews or the Gentiles as scripture calls them. For most of us in this room, or those of us listening online, you would be considered a Gentile. And then Peter, along with James and John, was tasked to preach the good news to the Jews. You find this in verse 9 of chapter 2. It says, James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me, and remember Paul's writing the letter to the church of Galatia, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. So right there, Paul is confirming that they were all on the same page. It didn't matter if they were talking to Gentiles or if they were talking to Jews, the same page meant that they were all telling what? The good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you see, when God sent Jesus to die for our sins, God was creating one community, those who believe in Jesus Christ. And there are no barriers between those who believe in Jesus. Because remember, when you put your faith in Jesus, you are free. But somewhere along the way, Peter, James, and John are joined by a group of Jewish Christians. These are Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and they came to Galatia to help share this good news. But as soon as they show up on the scene, Peter, now surrounded, now remember, Peter was a good Jew as well, now surrounded by these Jewish Christians, starts to listen to them. 
And these Jewish Christians wanted everyone to have to ascribe to some of the practices that make Jews Jews, like circumcision and table fellowship. And this is when things go awry. See, for the Jews, especially a group of Jews called the Pharisees, they loved keeping rules. And God had established those laws to help them be in right relationship with God. So they weren't all bad. But as you'll remember, what Carrie said last week is when Jesus shows up, Jesus is the fulfillment of what? The laws. So these Pharisees had 229 rules relating specifically to table fellowship. You see, in Jesus' day, what you ate and who you ate with said a lot about you and about the people with whom you shared a meal. So the Jewish Christians show up. Before they showed up, Peter had been eating what the Gentiles had been eating, and he had been eating with the Gentiles. The Jewish Christians show up, and all of a sudden, Peter is no longer feeling the freedom to eat what they are eating, and he stops eating with those Gentiles. This is where Paul gets really annoyed. And I want you to know that in verse 13, he has some pretty harsh words for Peter, James, and John. If you're in your Bible, you can read along with me. It's Galatians 2, verse 13, and this is what he says. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. What word does he use to Peter and the others for their behavior to say you have to eat certain things and not eat with certain people? Hypocrisy. Ouch. You know, one of the main reasons that people say they quit attending church today is because it's full of hypocrites. And when I talk with someone about that, I say, yeah, I agree. You see, we're all sinners saved by the grace of God, not by our own works. I mean, hypocrisy means, wouldn't you agree, sometimes we don't live what we say we believe. That makes us hypocrites. But Paul is not happy with Peter, James, and John and those Jewish Christians for behaving in this way. Now I have a question to ask you. Raise your hand if you have been attending church regularly most of your life. Okay, in this group, that's most of you. What about for the past five years? Okay, I'm pretty, pretty sure that includes everyone now. I want you to think about this question. What traditions or behaviors do we hang on to today in the church that might be uncomfortable for those who are new to church? Think about that for a second. What are some of the things we do week after week in here that might make someone who's first time in church never heard the good news of Jesus Christ and they show up to worship with us? Well, I asked the church staff this very same question and they had lots of responses, but these were just a few of the things that they shared. Our time of offering. I mean, if someone has never attended church before, we pass this plate week after week asking for money. That's kind of strange. What about our time of welcome when we ask people to stand and greet one another? I am here for the very first time. I might be pretty introverted and you ask me to stand and shake someone's hand that I don't even know. I mean, that's kind of weird. What about the way we worship and the way we sing together? Some people jump up and down. Some people raise their hands. Some people stand and don't sing at all. And you're asking me, except when we're in pandemic, to stand by someone I may not even know and sing out loud to songs I've never heard. Awkward. Okay, and the last one. How about the insider language we use? I mean, we talk about being covered by the blood of Jesus. That is just gross. Or how about when we say, hey, come to the altar. What altar and why? And what is an altar? Or how about when we talk so freely about God's grace? When we use grace outside of this place, we usually mean someone who's sure-footed and doesn't fall and stumble easily. 
Is that what we're talking about with God? We all can see just by those few examples. The list is endless about the practices and traditions that we hold dear. And I'm not saying that we need to get rid of all of those. But when they become our focus, we are just like Peter and the Jewish Christians. Paul calls them false brothers and hypocrites. And according to Richard B. Hayes in his commentary on Galatians, he does this because they are allowing something other than the gospel to be their identity. Hayes claims that when we allow the identity of our community of faith, that's us, to be defined by any sort of national, cultural, or even religious marker, then we are making the same error as the false brothers. So if that's the case, then if at NBC we define ourselves by our style of worship or the way we celebrate the Lord's Supper or by the kind of people we let in or those we keep out or the politicians we support, then according to Paul, we are not focusing on the main thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul wants our identity to be grounded solely in the story of Jesus' death and his resurrection. We should never let our focus be on secondary things to the extent that we stop being about the main thing, Jesus Christ. And I guarantee for some of you who are sitting in this room who raised your hand that you have been attending church most of your life, would you say that you have been a part of a church that has focused more on the secondary things than on the main thing? My guess is you would answer yes. It is so easy to lose our focus, just like it was for Peter. He had walked with Jesus. He had seen Jesus do miracles. He had seen him walk on water. Yet when Jewish Christians show up on the scene, he's so scared of being judged by them for not being a good Jew that he loses his focus on the main thing, Jesus Christ. I do want you to know that we can be encouraged by the way Paul and Barnabas respond. I do think it's pretty easy today to be discouraged by the culture in which we find ourselves. On staff, we talk about this frequently because right now we live in a culture where there's really no right or wrong. Morality is often considered a bad word. And so we find ourselves in what Jim Dennison calls a cancel culture, meaning that you can remove your support for public figures or organizations in response to their objectionable behaviors or their opinions. Now, that doesn't sound like a bad thing. All of us have boycotted some, some institution that we thought was focusing on something we didn't support. But you see, now in today's age, using social media, anyone can organize a boycott, a boycott or a protest. And sometimes it's not even something that's based on truth or something that's really worthwhile. And so what Jim Dennison says in this cancel culture is we focus so much on what we want to cancel and get rid of that we're losing the cornerstone of what American society was based on. And that is free exchange of ideas and thoughts. So for those of us who are here being told we've got to share the good news of Jesus Christ, we're not even sure how to do that anymore. Well, this is where Paul and Barnabas come in because you see, they refused to yield even for a second to the pressure of conforming to the expectations of what normal religious behavior looked like. And for them, that was Jewish practices. For us, it might be something we do in this room that feels normal to us, but is an, is an obstacle for those who might be new. Because guess what? Paul makes it clear that, that God's activity in the world which God is active all the time. God is at work, whether we understand the culture or not. It will face opposition and conflict, and we must not give in or give up. Did you hear that this morning? If we're confused about the culture in which we find ourselves, what Paul is saying we must not give in or give up on proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. 
It doesn't matter if people think we're being intolerant or judgmental. It does matter how we proclaim it. Hear that carefully. More people turn people away from God because of the way they share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we do have to be careful and make sure the way we share it is supported by God's word. But you know, Paul had had this amazing experience with God. And so he knew that when we experience Jesus, we have a radical transformation in our lives. And this is good news. It isn't based on social status, wealth, geography, gender, education, intelligence. It's based on nothing else but putting our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. I want you to hear how Eugene Peterson in his um, paraphrase of the gospel, it's called the message. I often go to it if, especially with Paul, Paul can be kind of thick in the way he writes things. So listen to Galatians 2, verses 15 and 16, and then 19 and 21 as they're shared in the message. We Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule keeping, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. How do we know? We tried it and we had the best system of rules the world has ever seen. Convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement, we believed in Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah not by trying to be good. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping the rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man, and I started being God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It's no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion, and I'm no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it's lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to go back on that. If a living relationship with God could come by rule keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. For those of you who know me, my personality is one of those that I really like rules. I like there to be a set of rules for how you're supposed to behave. But if I try to encapsulate my faith in Jesus into a set of rules, then I am just like the false brothers I am convinced more and more that the reason so many young people claim to not have faith in Jesus is because they think it is about simply following a set of rules. You see, young people, they wanna live free. They do wanna make a difference in a world that is so clearly broken, but they don't simply want to be a part of a huge authoritarian government or church or system. And that is exactly what Paul is preaching against in this passage. Paul says that to live free, to make a difference, to embody love and peace and world-changing values, you simply have to put Jesus first. You don't follow a set of rules. Your identity is in Jesus, and Jesus is love. Jesus is peace. Jesus radically changes the world. I mean, Jesus is God with us. You don't follow the rules. You have a relationship with a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And it's out of this relationship with Jesus that God's power and love lives in us, and then you can change the world. I love it because you are never alone we hear on staff constantly about loneliness being one of the pervasive things in our society today. And it breaks my heart because I think if you really knew Jesus, I'm not saying I don't ever feel lonely, but I know intellectually and usually I can feel it in my heart that God 
is with me. I am never truly alone. Now, this is where the, the, it kind of rubs. You know, I have a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, and a 16-year-old, and we've been having lots of conversations in COVID. So if y'all don't have to follow a set of rules, then this means my behavior doesn't have to change, right? Wrong. When I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, does that mean I'm gonna live differently? Yes, it does. When your ego is no longer central and you put Christ first, what matters to God, it matters to you. So some of your behaviors, your attitudes, your philosophies, they will change because you are allowing the main thing to be the main thing in your life. Our August memory verse is Galatians 5, verse 13, and it says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. We mentioned earlier those churchy words that make newcomers feel uncomfortable because they don't hear them much in the real world, or maybe we use them differently in church. One of these words Paul uses frequently in verse 16 when he says this, Know that a person is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we we may be justified by, by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Can you guess what churchy word Paul used three times in this passage? Justified, exactly. In my everyday world, I might use this word to say something like, My doctors were justified in using that treatment for my illness because justified means having a good or legitimate reason. But when used in church, justified means we are declared or made right before God. Pastor Kerry uses this simple definition. He says justified means just as if I'd never sinned. So when sin entered our world with Adam and Eve, every person is born after that time a sinner. Now, that's kind of hard to imagine. I mean, those of you who have grandbabies, I mean, that precious little newborn is really a sinner? Well, just wait. When they turn two, what are some of the first words they say? No and mine. I mean, God's plan to ensure that we could live in relationship with God forever was to send his son Jesus to die for our sins, raise him from the dead three days later, and when we put our faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, we are justified or made right with God or it is just as if we'd never sinned. Isn't that amazing? All we have to do is believe and put our faith in Jesus and then it is just as if we'd never sinned. Okay, I have to admit that one of the things that was most difficult for me when the world pandemic happened, and especially for in the U.S. in March when it hit here hard, was the loss of March Madness. I grieved it. I won't lie. I love college basketball. Well, in 2013, when his team was preparing for the conference championships, head coach for the South Dakota Jackrabbits, Scott Nagy, gave an inspiring speech. Listen to what he told his players. I want you to play like you're loved. Play freely. Love isn't dependent on your performance. No matter how you play, you are loved. Play with that in mind. What would it look like in our world today if we lived like we are loved, forgiven, and made right in Christ? That is Paul's encouragement to us today. Quit living by the rules and start living like you are loved. Let's pray. Gracious God, we confess that sometimes it is really challenging for us to remember how much you love us. God, we fall short every day. We gossip, we're unloving to our spouse or to our children. We are frustrated easily at work and so irritated sometimes by our coworkers. God, we don't understand your plan for our lives, especially with everything changing right now. We're not even sure we're gonna have a job. And yet in the midst of that, God, you ask us to trust in you, to put our faith in your son, Jesus, and then it is just as if we'd never sinned. We are made right with you. 
God, what good news that we can live forever with you. And God, someday you're gonna come back and everything is gonna be made perfect again. And for those of us who believe, we get to join in that party. So help us with our unbelief. Gracious God, we are so grateful to be in this place worshiping today. We don't take it for granted. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.